Hey guys, welcome back to part two in this video series that's all about teaching you about Bitcoin fundamental analysis. In the previous video, part one, we talked about the basics of Bitcoin's token economics. In this video, we're diving into growth metrics. Basically, how do you look at the Bitcoin network and the flow of people and capital to see if Bitcoin is growing or contracting? And in future videos, we're gonna talk about valuation models, market timing tools, and off-chain factors that influence Bitcoin's price and health. So let's start by answering the question, what are the growth metrics that are most valuable when looking at Bitcoin? Now a 30,000 foot overview of growth metrics is basically measuring the health of the Bitcoin network. And we look at things like how many new market participants are coming into the space, and we can use both on-chain and off-chain research tools. So on-chain meaning all of the data that you get from the actual transactions that are happening on the main Bitcoin blockchain. And then we use these metrics to determine if Bitcoin is either growing or contracting and at what rate of change that's happening. In other words, is Bitcoin exploding in growth and popularity or is price selling off and the overall health of the network is contracting. So let's start by taking a look at some on-chain growth metrics. The first thing we'll look at is active addresses and entities. So if we jump over to Glassnode, which I'll link up below if you guys wanna get signed up with Glassnode, but the first thing we'll look at here is uh, the number of active addresses. And the way that they define this is the number of unique Bitcoin addresses that were active in the network as either a sender or receiver. So basically a Bitcoin wallet address that either sent or received Bitcoin on a day or a week. In this case, we're looking at a one week chart. So we get basically one pivot point for each week. And you can see that over time, if we go all the way back in Bitcoin's history, uh, there was basically very, very few active Bitcoin addresses for the first year or two. And then really in 2013 or 14 is where we started to see that kind of exponential steady growth. And then things got really out of control in the bubble of 2017. And you can see that ever since then, we've been having kind of steady growth back to the upside. So active addresses are important because it shows the number of wallets that are actively transacting and sending and receiving Bitcoin. Now, another thing that we can look at that's kind of similar to active addresses is new addresses. So these are unique addresses that appeared for the first time in a transaction. And you can see if we do a comparison of active addresses smoothed out over one week, versus new addresses smoothed out over one week, that they're relatively in sync. These really don't deviate that much, but there's obviously gonna be a, a higher number of active addresses than brand new addresses. And now the second major metric that we look at is addresses that are holding X amount of Bitcoin. So what that means is how many addresses are holding anywhere from 0.1 Bitcoin or one Bitcoin or 10 Bitcoins or greater. And so you can see here, if we jump over to Glassnode, there's several different ways that we can filter this. You know, addresses that have uh, smaller than 0.01 or 0.1 Bitcoin or more than one whole Bitcoin. And usually what I do is I group these into a couple of different categories. So I tend to think of addresses that hold less than one Bitcoin as retail addresses. Those are typically, individuals that are either holding Bitcoin maybe on a mobile wallet or on an exchange or maybe smaller investors where the wallets that have over 10 or definitely 100 Bitcoin, those are typically gonna be whales that maybe have been holding Bitcoin for a long period of time or they might be wallets that are controlled by exchanges. And if we take a look here, you'll notice that the addresses with a balance over 0 .1, 0 0.1 Bitcoin has been going up pretty steadily over time. And that's uh, also true with uh, wallets that hold over one whole Bitcoin. But you can see as we start to look at addresses that hold over 10 Bitcoins, that as price goes up over time, the number of wallets that hold more than 10 Bitcoins actually flattens out. And it makes sense because if we go back and look at, you know, when the price of Bitcoin was below $500, you only needed $5,000 to have 10 Bitcoins in the same wallet. 
where when the price is up over 10 or $20,000, you need a lot more capital to hold that amount in the same wallet. So as price goes up, it just becomes more cost prohibitive to hold more Bitcoins in the same wallet. And you can see that the number, when you start to get above 100, that number actually starts to go down over time. And there's probably several reasons for that. One of them being security and diversification purposes. You know, people probably just feel more comfortable keeping a lower amount of Bitcoins in more wallets. And the next group of metrics we look at are things like hash rate and difficulty. And hash rate and difficulty kind of go hand in hand. And this really gives some insight into the health of the Bitcoin protocol and really the computing power that goes into mining Bitcoin, which is how new Bitcoins are released every 10 minutes or so. And you can see in Bitcoin's history, the hash rate has also been going up pretty exponentially over the past 10 years. And the hash rate really references the number of computing hashes per second produced by the miners in the network. And then the difficulty, which you can see has also been going up over time, really refers to the number of hashes required to mine a block. Now, if you're not super technical or really into mining, you don't have to focus on this stuff too much. Just know that as the difficulty and the hashing power goes up over time, that's basically increasing the security of the overall Bitcoin protocol. And you can see if we do a comparison of the hash rate and the difficulty, they really move in sync together. And you can also look at something that's called the difficulty ribbon, which is more of a market timing tool. And we'll talk about this in a later video, but this basically uh, implements moving averages to uh, give you a little bit more uh, context and show you when there have been good buying opportunities. And this was also created by our buddy Willy Woo. And the next thing we look at is production costs. In other words, what does it cost to mine a Bitcoin? And there's a couple things that go into the cost, like the cost of the actual miner itself. Ow, f <laughs> damn it. No! Ugh. So like this is a Bitcoin miner. You can see they're big bulky. This is an ASIC. It's not really profitable anymore, but when this thing was at its prime, it cost several thousand dollars just for the damn miner. But in addition to the miners, you also have to pay for electricity to run the miner. And this guy, Charles Edwards wrote a really good article talking about Bitcoin's production and electrical costs. So I'll link this up in the description so you can see an explanation of how this works in detail. But one thing to keep in mind is you can actually use production cost to somewhat forecast the price of Bitcoin. So if we read here, it says the price of any commodity tends to gravitate towards the production cost. We've seen this in things like metals, right? Gold, silver, and platinum. We know what it costs to mine one ounce of gold. And typically you'll notice that as the cost of gold goes up and down, also do the production costs. If we continue, it says if the price is below the cost, then production slows down. So that starts to slow down the new supply, where if the price is above the cost, you can make a profit by generating and selling more. And at the same time, the increased production would increase the difficulty pushing the cost of generating towards the price. So in some sense, the difficulty and hash rate and production costs all go hand in hand. And the more expensive Bitcoin becomes, inherently the more expensive it becomes to mine that because of competition and vice versa. And just kind of a side tangent, this is why a lot of commodities like lumber and oil and things that have competitive production uh, seem to move within a price range. To give you a quick example of this, if we look at lumber futures, so lumber is wood that's typically used in construction. And you can see over the past several decades, the price of lumber has basically been in between about $200 to $500. And anytime it gets to the upper end of that range, lumber producers increase their supply, which inherently pushes price down. And as price goes down, they decrease their supply, which put, pushes price back to the upside. And you can see most recently during the coronavirus pandemic, prices went through the roof, which really increased production. And that's why you get V tops. And Bitcoin is at some level a commodity, just like 
gold, just like oil, just like lumber. It has properties that make it way more valuable to some people because it operates as money in a store of wealth. But some of the same inherent factors of production costs do play into the price of Bitcoin. And you can see Charles actually created this uh, indicator for TradingView that shows the estimated production cost over time. And you can see sometimes the price of Bitcoin gets way ahead of itself. And sometimes when it dips into the red, it actually becomes unprofitable on average to mine. But those are typically in hindsight, good buying opportunities. And in the last video, we talked about market cap, right? Market capitalization, which is the price of one Bitcoin multiplied by the supply. Now, another metric that we can use is what's called realized cap. And the team at Coinmetrics wrote this good article talking about what realized capitalization is. But to summarize, what they're really looking to do is de-emphasize lost coins. Because over time, there are Bitcoins that get lost and can never be recovered. And so over here, we can actually compare the market cap versus the realized cap. And again, you'll notice that the realized cap is much lower than the total market cap after we try to make those adjustments for lost coins. And you can see in this article, so how is realized cap calculated? The realized cap attempts to improve on the market cap by trying to discount coins that might be lost. So in addition to just looking at the price of one Bitcoin or the overall market cap, now you can use realized cap as an extra tool in your arsenal. And this final metric, which really isn't on chain for Bitcoin, but it is closely linked, is stable coin growth. And stable coins are cryptocurrencies that are created that are meant to be pegged to fiat currencies like the US dollar. And they're meant to be backed by US dollars in some bank account somewhere. So if you print one token that represents $1 stable coin, in theory, you're supposed to have $1 in a bank somewhere to back up that, that token, that stable coin. And so over time, what you can do is look at the growth of different stable coins like Binance USD, Tether, uh, USD coin through Coinbase, and you can track the growth of these over time. And typically what we see is when there's a lot of stable coins being minted, that can be a signal that there's more capital coming into the crypto ecosystem and could be a sign that Bitcoin's price is gonna go higher in the future. So those are the on-chain metrics that we can look at to determine if Bitcoin is expanding and growing or contracting and shrinking. Now, let's take a look at some off-chain growth metrics, meaning other things in the world that we can look at that aren't specific to the transactions on Bitcoin's blockchain. The first thing we'll look at is search engine volume. In other words, how many people are searching for keywords related to Bitcoin. And one of the easiest places you can go is trends.google.com since Google is currently the largest search engine in the world. And you can just type in different uh, search terms related to Bitcoin. So people that are typically looking for Bitcoin's price will type in the ticker, which is BTC USD. And you can see in the 2017 bubble, these made new all-time highs. And really, anytime there's a big pop in Bitcoin's price or when we start to go into a trending market, you can start to see these numbers go up. You can also search for things like Bitcoin or Bitcoin's price or other keywords that are related to uh, Bitcoin in general. Another thing you can search for is website traffic. So just like you can search for keywords, you can also look at specific websites like news sites related to Bitcoin and exchange traffic. And one of my favorite places to find this is a website called similarweb.com. And basically what you'll do is you'll search for a website like coindesk.com is one of the biggest news sites for cryptocurrencies. And if you scroll down, it'll give you a whole bunch of information like it's the global rank, uh, it's country rank, basically how much traffic it gets compared to other websites, and then also how many hits a month, how many website visits a month does it get. And if you see a trend where this is going up over time, that could also be a sign of big growth, where if a website is really falling off of a cliff, that might mean that there's declining interest in that. And just like you can look at a new site, we could also go check out like coinbase.com, which is one of the larger exchanges for retail investors. 
And if we scroll down, you can see that Coinbase over the past several months has been trending to the upside overall. And now another metric we can look at related to exchanges is exchange capital flow. In other words, is money coming onto exchanges? Is it coming off of exchanges? Is it increasing in volume? Is it decreasing? And if we go back to Glassnode, you can see there is a whole lot of metrics related to exchanges. You can look at things like exchange inflow, basically how much capital is coming into exchanges, uh, outflow, how much capital is leaving exchanges, the net flow of volume. So you can see uh, during time periods of high volatility, you'll get increases in uh, capital coming onto an exchange. And in times where you know, there's sell-offs, you'll typically see Bitcoin being pulled off of exchanges. You can also look at exchange balances. And you can see here, we have some of the top uh, Bitcoin exchanges by trading volume. And you can see how these volumes have gone up over time. And this is something we'll talk more about in a later video about how to actually time this by gauging the flow of capital on and off exchanges. And just like we can look at website traffic for websites related to cryptocurrencies, another thing you can do is look for news articles on non-crypto news websites. So when you start to see things like the Wall Street Journal and CNBC and some of the other mainstream news companies starting to talk about Bitcoin, that can be a sign that non-crypto people are starting to pay attention to Bitcoin and maybe it's going to draw in new eyeballs and ultimately new capital into the space. And we can also look at the growth of other crypto assets. These could be other cryptocurrencies. These could be other derivatives. These could be just altcoins or tokens on Ethereum. Uh, there's a lot of ways to judge this, but I'll show you my favorite way right now, which is taking a look at the total market cap excluding Bitcoin. So if we look at all the other major cryptocurrencies and you want to look at the market capitalization of all the other listed uh, cryptocurrencies excluding Bitcoin, uh, this is where you'd find that. Basically what we're looking for is are altcoins growing? Are they contracting? Are they outpacing Bitcoin? Are they not keeping up with Bitcoin? There's a lot of really valuable information you can find there as well. And then the final thing you can look at is BTC market dominance, meaning looking at the total market cap of all cryptocurrencies, how much of that is Bitcoin? And if we take a look at this chart, you can see that back in the early days in 2013 and 14, it was virtually 90 to 95%. And then during the altcoin boom of 2017, it got as low as about 30 to 35%. And then it really has been trending down over time as some altcoins have started to grow in popularity and ultimately value. And so I hope that helps you understand a little bit better how to look at Bitcoin and understand, is it growing? Is it healthy? Is it contracting? You know, these are some of the metrics that can be a bellwether as to what's going to come in the future. And in the next video, we're going to actually talk about valuation models, right? What are ways that we can determine what Bitcoin should or could be worth now and in the future? And then we'll also take a look at some market timing tools. Basically, how do you know when to get in and when to get out? And then we'll wrap up this video series by looking at some non-Bitcoin related factors that can actually influence Bitcoin's price. And when you take all this information and you pull it together, it can really give you a clear picture and help you understand, do you want to participate in Bitcoin? And if so, how much? Do you want to dedicate your life to it and go all in? Do you want to have it as a passive investment and part of your portfolio or somewhere in between? So again, guys, if you like this video series, give it a thumbs up and uh, share it with somebody you think would get value. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.